Uh, so the, the name Moses always uh, conjures up all kinds of things in our minds, um, especially when we say the name Moses in church. It makes us think of all kinds of different things. Um, when we say Moses, what comes to your mind? Just what, what words, what pictures, what image, what comes to your mind when you hear Moses? Like just first thing that comes to mind. Ten Commandments, oh, absolutely, Ten Commandments. I mean, it's like, yes, the two tablets. Um, anything else? What comes to mind when you hear of Moses? Far out. Far out, yeah, far out. <laughs> yeah. Striking the rock. Striking the rock, right, and the water comes out, and he's mad, and that doesn't go so well. We'll get to that in, a, in another few weeks. Uh, the, the staff, right? The parting of the sea. Yeah, it's like these big, I, yeah, Bill. Hey, stop that. We'll get that. <laughs> We'll get there in a minute. We, there's these big, iconic kinds of moments, right, when we think of Moses. Um, I, I don't always think of words. I think of pictures, too, and I imagine the same is true for you. I think of some pictures of Moses in some of his different elements, some of the times when we think about this Moses figure, when he's doing all these different big, huge kind of acts and these memorable things that Moses does. There's also other pictures that, that we hear of Moses, that we think about with Moses oftentimes, because, I mean, Moses is right, veggie tales, love veggie tales. Uh, Moses, Moses movies were huge. They've been made for the last hundred years. There's over a dozen feature movies that are about Moses, and they all do well. It doesn't matter if it's animation or live action, I mean, all of these movies have done incredibly well telling the story of Moses. I, and it, it's also hard to picture Moses without picturing some of the main you know, people who played Moses. I mean, these, these are these iconic figures that we think, oh, they did this, and they stood there, and they looked like that, and then they went there, and they were dressed like that. I mean, this, this is the Moses that we think of. The thing, though, is we need to get this Moses out of our minds, at least for now because we're not there yet. As we're going through the book of Exodus, none of this has happened yet. No parting of the waters, no staff turns into something else, no Ten Commandments, none of those big moments have happened. Moses is just Moses. He's just Moses. I mean, he, he's, he's a lot of things, though, so far that we have found. He's, he has an Egyptian background, and he has a Hebrew background. He's, he's now a fugitive recently. We'll come across some of that in the story. He's a fugitive in a foreign land. He's a herder of sheep. He is a husband, and he's a father, and he's somebody who lives on the land. This is Moses. He's, he's normal. I mean, he, this is not superhero, superpower, iconic figure Moses. This is normal, average kind of Moses. And there's something that happens to normal Moses that can happen and does happen to anyone. Moses encounters God. Anybody can encounter God. Sometimes when we have a, a, an encounter, an interaction, a, a, a crossing of paths with God, we call it all different kinds of things because it comes across in all sorts of different ways. Sometimes we call it an experience. I, I, I had an experience with God. Like, I, I, I had a sense about me that God was present more than usual. Or I had a sense about me that God was leading me in a certain direction or prompting me. I mean, we talk like that. I had an experience that was a little different than usual. It was, it was an experience, an encounter with God. We, we talk about other things, like uh, God called me to do things. He called me to go here, or God called me to do this. God, we have an encounter with, and God can call us. Sometimes we say, I, I've got a mission, I've got a new plan, I've got a new direction, because God is leading me in this way. Sometimes there's big moments, you know, like conversions. I, I, I was converted. And I encounter God, and so I have this conversion. Or sometimes we have these milestone moments that we, we, could, we could tell about four or five of them, maybe, throughout our lives. Some big times when we say, that was an encounter with God. And 
I'll remember that. Or maybe God answered a prayer. That's an encounter with God. It's an encounter with the power of God doing something specific. So I mean, we normal people like you and me, we have all these different encounters with God. And the Bible shows, and our lives, I think, show oftentimes that when we encounter God, we're often changed. Our minds are changed. Our habits are changed. Our feelings are definitely changed. All sorts of different things can be changed when we encounter God. Same thing is true throughout the Bible. Flip open to just about any page and somebody has an encounter with God that changes them. There's something about them because they interacted with God, because they had an experience of a prayer was answered or God led them in a new way or God spoke to them or whatever it is. They were changed and they go in a new direction. Something is different because they encountered God. Normal people encounter God. And when we normal people encounter God, it teaches us something about God and it helps us to follow God in a new way right now. We, we learn things about God and it sends us kind of on a new direction or a new path, hope, more hopeful, more reassured, more confident, new path, new way, whatever it is, we're changed in some sort of a different way. Same with Moses. Moses, the normal Moses, had an encounter with God, and it taught him things about God, and it sent him on a new path of how to follow God. Um, Moses ha has come a long way since we were last with Moses last week. Uh, last, last week, we had Moses in a basket, and Moses as a toddler. Moses has come a long way since then. Moses, after he was uh, found in the basket, rescued by the princess, the daughter of Pharaoh, returned to mom so she could feed him and nurse him. He was returned to the princess. And after that, we really don't know much of what happened to Moses. So what would be helpful is if we have a map, because a lot of things happened to Moses. After Moses was returned to Pharaoh's daughter. A while later, years had passed, and Moses witnesses the poor treatment of his people in Egypt, his Hebrew people. There's an Egyptian that's treating a Hebrew poorly, and Moses takes it out on the Egyptian. Moses soon finds out that people realize the bad thing he did, so he runs away. From his home in the Nile River, Goshen area, he runs far, far away, probably hundreds of miles away to the land of Midian in the desert. And that's where he shows some kindness to some women at a well. He earns the favor of their dad, ends up marrying one of their daughters, has a child, and settles in the land as a sheep herder. Years and years pass. Another 40 years pass. Moses is now about 80 years old, and he is living in this land in the desert. This is where he's been for decades. And he's pastoring his flock, his father-in-law's flock, and he realizes, for whatever reason that he needs to take the flock to another place to graze. So he takes them not just to the field next door, not just to the pasture land, wherever that is nearby. He takes them to a completely different section of the desert, this whole different area, maybe a hundred-ish or so miles away. And it's there where Moses has an encounter with God. So that's where we pick up the story. And this is Moses' encounter with God. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush. Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. So, so Moses has this encounter with God, and there, there are no less than, than three 
things that God does with Moses, some, some things where, where God grabs Moses' attention, teaches Moses about who God is, and sends Moses in a different direction. First one is the bush. Now, Moses is in the desert. I mean, he's been living in the desert for decades. He knows the desert. He knows the area. He knows the land. And he comes to this new area. And what does he see? What captivates his attention? This bush that's burning. Moses sees and finds a bush in the middle of the desert that is burning, but not consumed. And he's captivated. He's amazed by it. He, he looks at it and he realizes, what is this that is burning? What's happening? Because it's not being consumed. It, it's burning up. Something's happening. There's flames. There's heat. There's fire. But it's, it's not being consumed. And he wonders, well, what is this? And so he says, in amazement, I must, I must go closer. I must see what this is and what is happening. Moses had encountered a lot of things in the desert, but he had never encountered anything like the burning bush. Now, we know that it was the angel of the Lord who was in the middle of the bush, who was in the fire, who was the fire. The presence of God was the fire in the bush. And we know that throughout the Bible, God appears as light. God appears as fire. God appears as power in that fire, because we have Bible dictionaries, and we have commentaries, and we have smart people who've studied this stuff before who can tell us. Moses didn't have a Bible dictionary. So he saw a bush, and he thought, that's weird. What is it? And he was captivated by it. He was captivated by it. And Moses didn't realize that soon something like this was going to lead him all through the desert as a pillar of fire at night. And the power of God was going to continue to show God's self to him and to all of God's people, as the people of Israel, as flames, as fire, as consuming fire, as power. And this metaphor would go on and on. This was just the beginning of what God was going to do with this burning bush. Moses saw something so strange. And it made Moses realize and it makes us realize that God does not do normal. God does a lot of things in our lives. We could tell a lot of stories, and at least the stories I tend to hear is that God doesn't do things in a normal way. God does things in an odd way. God does things in a crazy way. God does things in an unexpected way and in a surprising way, in a way that catches us off guard, and we wonder what just happened? I mean, flip open the Bible to just about any story, and it's God doing something that is not normal. I mean, from the very beginning, Abraham and Sarah could not conceive a child, and they wondered what is going on. And in their old age, way past the years when they should be able to, they have a child. God gives them a child. Not normal. When the people, of, uh, when the people were building a tower, and they were building this super high tower to heaven in Genesis, God wants to get rid of the tower because they're too powerful. God doesn't just destroy the tower, which would make sense. God confuses their language, and then they can't do anything about building the tower anymore. I mean, God does things in such strange ways. Jesus, when Jesus was teaching people, and they were all hungry, and Jesus, his disciples say, well, where are we going to get food? Jesus doesn't call in the food trucks. Jesus gives them food. He makes it miraculously happen. And God just does things that are not normal. We need a not normal God to do things that we desperately need in our world needs. Thank God that God does not do normal things and that we normal people get to experience all of this not normal stuff that God does. So God encounters Moses in the burning bush. Right after the burning bush, God says something to Moses. God starts talking about sandals. God says to Moses, 
several things about sandals. So let's, let's dig into this a little bit. God says to Moses that he needs to take off his sandals. Does Moses need to move from where he is at all, or does he just need to stay right where he is? He stays right where he is. When he takes off his sandals, does he get permission? Does he get allowed to go anywhere else? No. Where he is is just where he stays. How does God describe, or the angel of the Lord of the voice, how does that describe the place where he is standing? What does the angel of the Lord call that place where he's standing? Holy ground. So Moses is standing on holy ground. He doesn't have to go somewhere else to get holy ground. He's already standing on holy ground. People in Moses' day and soon after, we find this throughout the Bible, Deuteronomy, Ruth, there's some places where this happens, where people actually take off their sandal to make an agreement with people. You know, certainly, you know, taking off your sandal keeps the room clean and the house clean. Certainly, it's a sign of respect for other people as you enter their house. But there's also this whole layer of agreements that people have. So when somebody was making an agreement about a land, they wouldn't just shake a hand. Uh, they wouldn't sign mortgage documents or uh, appraisal documents or anything else for their land. They would actually, they would take off their sandals as a way of saying, I'm not on this land anymore. It's not mine. I'm not walking on this land like I used to. It's not mine. I give it up. It's, it's yours. It's no longer my land. So for God to say, take off your sandals, this is not your land. This is my land, God says. This is holy land. Where is Moses? He's in the desert. He's been in the desert for a long time. There's desert all around him. He doesn't have to go anywhere else to get to holy ground. He's on holy ground. God is saying, this is my holy ground, and I'm going to do all kinds of things on this holy ground. You better watch out what's going to happen next. Because God is launching Moses into a story. God is encountering Moses to grab Moses' attention, to teach Moses about him, so that Moses is changed, and that Moses can then follow God into a brand new place. The holy ground that he's standing on makes Moses realize, God is a lot bigger than I think. And I think that may be obvious to us. God is a lot bigger than we think. But we need to be reminded that God is a lot bigger than we think. I need to be reminded that God is a lot bigger than I think. God can do a whole lot more than I think. God is capable of doing so much more. God thinks so much bigger. God conceives of the world in so much bigger terms. God understands time like I don't understand time. God is bigger than we think. Throughout the Bible, the whole Bible's trajectory is that, that, that we, we grow. We grow in our grace and knowledge and understanding of the Lord Jesus. We, we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. We dwell on the things of heaven, not the things of earth. There's all this language that says, grow, think bigger, because God is bigger than we are. God's land, God's territory, and the things that God can do are so much bigger. So God has the, these encou this encounter with Moses and tells him these things, and there's, there's something else that God continues to say after this. So he, he grabs Moses' attention with the bush and with the sandals and the holy ground, and then God starts talking to him about God's plans. God says, okay, get ready. Because I have heard the cries of my people. I've heard the groans of my people for their suffering and their enslavement. I've heard that they are treated poorly, that they are not well, and I will rescue them. I will rescue them from slavery in Egypt, and I will bring them to the promised land that I promised to their ancestors, Abraham, the children of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He tells them all these things that he's going to do. And Moses, I mean, you got to think, Moses is like, great, that's what we've been hoping for for a long, long time. The people talk about it. They tell stories about it. I've heard this over and over. And Moses is like, this is great. And then God says, and I'm sending you to Pharaoh to get the people out of Egypt. And yeah, I mean, Moses is like, 
wait a minute. You're big and mighty and amazing. You can do far out crazy things and you're sending me to go? I would have a lot of questions. Good thing is Moses has a lot of questions. So here's, here's how Moses responds to God's calling of him. But Moses protested to God. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. Good for Moses. Who am I to do this? I mean, I, Pharaoh, power, victory, resources, everything at his disposal, fear is built into him. Who am I? Does God answer the question? Moses asks, who am I? Does he answer the question? No, I love that he doesn't answer the question. But God does say, I will be with you. Now, surely that would reassure us, you know, yes, God's going to be with me. Okay, but I need some might. I need some power. I need some strength. I need some armor. I need some resources. That's not what God says. God says, I'm going to be with you. And somehow or another, that's enough. In fact, it's more than enough. As we see throughout the story, Moses thrives and Moses succeeds because God is with him, because Moses is not doing it on his own strength. When God says, I am with you, it is enough. It is sufficient for us to be able to handle what's in front of us. Good thing is that's not the only question Moses asks. I like his other question, too. He has, he has a second one. His second question is here. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? Moses, God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. God answers this in two ways. The, the sec, he, he tells Moses two things. The second one, he says to Moses, tell them that I'm the same as I've always been. I'm the same God who came to your ancestors. I'm the same God who said this promise over and over. I'm the same one who's been there. God comes through. God promised it so long ago. God reinforced the promise. And even though it's been a long time, even though it's not on the people's terms, God is coming through. God is fulfilling. God is coming good on God's promise. God comes through. God also answers it in saying, say to the people, I am has sent me to you, which is, sounds like bad grammar at first. It's kind of a strange way of saying this. But God saying, I am has sent me to you is a way of saying God's name in two different ways. It's showing I am, that God is present here and now. And it can also mean I will be. Same word, just means I will be. Same thing at the same time. God's saying, I am, and God's saying, I will be. God is going to be with them. God is with them now, and God will be with them through all that they go through. God will be with them. God is always with us, all the time, throughout everything that happens. So when, when Moses encounters God, he learns all these different things about God. All these different things about who God is, and then it launches him into another place. It's, these are great things, and they're great truths, and they're good for us to know about who God is, but they're like stamps. Anybody, anybody bought stamps? I mean, we don't use stamps as often as we used to, and they're really expensive now. 73 cents a stamp, I mean... But they're like stamps. You buy a sheet of stamps, and you get to choose your own stamps. Like, do I want flags? Or do I want this, this cool seasonal illustration? Do I want the flowers? Do I want... I mean, we have all these neat designs of stamps. And you buy a sheet of stamps, and they're super cool to look at. But they don't do anything until you put it on an envelope and put it in the mailbox. Then the stamp is actually doing its work. These things are like stamps. They're really cool to look at and to think about, 
But when we use them and when we do them and we say, God, I need you to be with me right now. God, I need you to come through and I know that you do. That's when they start to work. That's when the presence of God is really working and pushing us to take a next step in our lives. May we have encounters with God like Moses does, like normal people, to see the power and the work of God in us. Would you pray with me?